You're listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And we are with Daniel Freib. Hello, chaps. We're How's it going? <laughs> Daniel, very what? engaged. He, we've got him in person now, but he's looking at his phone. Well, I've, yeah, um, he's a bit worried about my train. We've got to get a train um, soon, but we've got plenty of time, don't worry. That's, that's nice. Um, where are we, Lionel? Well, we are. Uh, we're kind of in the gateway to France, aren't we? We're at St Pancras, and the trains go straight, well, the Eurostar goes straight out of here and goes straight to Paris, where this morning the 2018 Tour de France route was officially unveiled. Um, I was very I- pleased to note that it tallied exactly with the route that I'd been, uh, I'd been sent by a, by a mole a couple of weeks ago. So <laughs> having spent year, many of the recent years saying how I dislike all the leaks and rumours in the lead up to the Tour de France route, it's like spoiling Christmas by opening all your presents early. It, this morning was really flat for me because I already knew, knew the route, sadly. I also like the way you made it, it sound like we were connected somehow to events in Paris today uh, and the well we, we are we're yeah, connected we, by we a are, train track yeah by Remember sitting a in a station ago, Rich, from which a train leaves to yeah well a few years ago we mm. did go to the presentation in Paris didn't we and we meant to record the podcast there put it off and put it off and put it off and ended up recording it after we'd returned back to London <laughs> back in this very spot exactly pretty much yeah we did <laughs> Um, yeah, it's uh, well. We, we're going to mainly talk about the Tour de France route for 2018 in this podcast. Uh, I think Daniel's just still researching all the claims and so on. You know, mm. very, very mm. diligent, very well, diligent. He's on he, mountain he is our mountain man. He? Yeah, yeah. Do we go to the Dolomites this year? Uh, no, we don't. You had to think about that. <laughs> no. um, but yeah, we've, we're also going to hear from Chris Froome because I was in Monaco last week before the, the route was announced, obviously, speaking to him. What's interesting is he clearly didn't, didn't know what it was. He knew as much as any of us. Um, he thought there was going to be a time trial around Lake Annecy. Oh, it's in Lionel. You, I, c- I could have told you that wasn't going to happen. You could have told him <laughs> what it was. But anyway, because um, I think a lot of us assume that the riders kind of are tipped off or that they're not just um, surprised while sitting there in the auditorium. But that's clearly the case. I think in recent years there have been more kind of leaks and misdirection, I think, because uh, there, there was a lot of speculation, for example, that Alpe d'Huez would be attacked from a different direction using one of the, the back roads. That turns out not to be the case. They'll be using the famous 21 hairpin <laughs> climb. Um, so while a few things were reported by it's mostly by local French newspapers isn't it who kind of they get the information from local dignitaries and what have you and uh, end up piecing together the route in advance but this year a few of the things were kept quite well under wraps erroneous yeah shall we um, shall we do a news round up Lionel before we crack on with the route well it's very brief this week um, the presidential tour of Turkey was the, the big world tour race although it feels a bit strange to call it a world tour race because only four world tour teams actually took part and they dominated it Uh, Sam Bennett the Irish sprinter riding for Bora Hansgrohe won the first three stages and stage five Diego Ulisi of UAE Team Emirates won stage four and that set up his overall win and then Edward Turns won the last stage and one more world tour race to go that's the tour of Guangxi in uh, in China um, thanks to a couple of listeners who emailed correcting my pronunciation of Guangxi last week I said Guangxi Guangxi it's not a j sound it's a sh sound um, we have our colleague from the Vuelta Fan Reyes going there is uh, it it's going to be cracking there. Yeah. Can, no, I, I honestly think it's going to be cracking well he's, he's promised to report back for us he's going to get the landscape stuff there. there in the southern part of China with the casts K-A-R-S-T I don't know if cast is a kind of rock or is the actual formations themselves, the form of the formations. Anyway, these big conical mountains um, that region of China is famous for. Well, I think we're all scarred by the tour of Beijing. This could be quite different. Indeed. Something to, something to watch. Sorry, Indeed. Lionel, don't you no, finish. No, that's all right. That's all right. Um, another couple of bits of news. Jan Bacalantz, who had that terrible crash at the Il Lombardia a couple of weekends ago, he is out of hospital 
um, after having an operation on his spine. It will be a long road to recovery for him, but he is uh, fortunately he's out of hospital. And a big bit of transfer news today. Fabio Aru is leaving Astana to join UAE Team Emirates, where he will share the GC leadership duties with Ireland's Dan Martin. Interesting move. Yeah, we, we kind of expected it, didn't we? Um, maybe running out of options, Fabio Aru, but we expect him to lead the team at the Giro, do we, Daniel and Dan Martin at the Tour? Very much so. I think um, there is going to be no confusion or no friction between Dan Martin and Fabio Aru because they have been signed, both of them, on those respective promises that Aru is going to do the Giro and Martin the Tour. Okay. So the tour, the presentation of the route um, is always very. Uh, they do it well, don't they? It's it's a it's quite a, it's a good show. I've never been. Well, I mean, just even watch it on on I TV. I've never watched it either. <laughs> <laughs> I just wait for the uh, route. Yeah, it's quite. I'm just sitting there with you, my. Do you enjoy it, Lionel? Um, kind of. There's a. Well, I, I don't know whether it's the same as it was a couple of years ago when we went, but all, all the times I've been, there's a big kind of foyer outside the Palais de Congress where everyone kind of gathers and there's sort of a few drinks going around and canapes and, and um, you, you, you find yourself bumping shoulders with sports directors and former riders and current riders sometimes and journalists and, every, you know, kind of a lot of VIPs, I guess. I mean, not, not necessarily connected with the world of cycling, but they will be people from all of the different regions, uh, towns and regions that are hosting the race. Um, and then everyone filters into the Palais de Congress and sits in. It's like a big cinema. You can get a translation if you want and listen to the uh, all the formalities and, uh, and and now it's on TV. That kind of mystique is, uh, is yeah, broken down a bit. Not, and everyone can join in and, and watch the race. And notwithstanding that very good summing up line, I've never heard a good story about the tour presentation. Never heard a good I story. I quite enjoy the, the twinkle in uh, Christian Prudhomme's eye as he stands there. Oh, with yeah. The, the best quote ever from Christian Prudhomme at the tour presentation was a few years ago. What was it? It was, it was something cycling is, wasn't street, it was swag. Cycling, le vélo is swag. <laughs> and, no, I have got a good story. <laughs> Correct me, I've got a good story. Because Christian Prudhomme, a few months later, informed me. I made some stupid mock-up on um, on Twitter where I superimposed Christian Prudhomme's head on the notorious B.I.G. As you do, <laughs> as you do, with the caption, Le Villor is swag. And Christian Prudhomme sent me a text message because his daughter had seen um, this meme... I don't think it went quite viral <laughs> enough to constitute a meme. A meme. And he, meme was, he was most amused meme by it. Re- retweet. <laughs> he was most amused by it. <laughs> so there you go. I started two I, minutes ago, I said there were no good stories about tour presentation. But just that's come a, up that's with that belt. That's an belter. absolute cracker, yeah. That's, that's certainly worth waiting for. How about the route? Was it worth waiting for? Is it for? swag, well, Lionel? Is Lavello still swag? I was just going to, on a more slightly more serious note, Christian Prudhomme began his presentation today by making uh, quite a serious point about cycle safety and, and drivers particularly um, respecting cyclists on the road Um, you know he made the point that you know from the top professionals down to um, you know families and children uh, riding bikes on roads you know we're all kind of vulnerable I guess and uh, he held up a jersey with the um, it's a French rule law not is it a law that you must give cyclists a 1.5 meters of room when overtaking in a car? I think it's a law, yeah. It's certainly a, law, a campaign, yeah. isn't it? Spain campaign. has done the most yeah. on this so far. Of all the sort of Western European nations, Spain has done the most on a kind of legal level. It was interesting seeing the, the the Tour de France, which is obviously the organizer of a of a sporting event, um, taking uh, you know taking that line right at the start of the unveiling of their their route because i think they recognize that um the, you know the next generation of cyclists the next generation of tour de france riders um they need to have safe roads to to ride their bikes on. just on that don't want to upset prudy if he's listening but on safety um the transfer we'll get to we'll go week by week i think aren't we going through the the the, the route but the transfer on the last or the penultimate evening and um, back to paris which entails a very long drive for most people covering the race is from the furthest point in metropolitan france or mainland france back to paris not terribly safe i don't think at the end of three weeks it's, that's that's a really good point i think lionel and i will be flying home rather than driving up to paris as we did this year bailing out early but um yeah that is a good point i mean this this is now an absolute 
this is dogma, isn't it? That the, 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 the penultimate stage finishes somewhere in the Alps of the Pyrenees and then there's this huge slog back to, to, to Paris. And it used to be a journey back to Paris. The tour, the tour certainly the first year I did, you were, you were winding your way back to the capital. And so Paris felt like a natural ending continuation. Now it feels like something quite different, something bolted on to the end. And I think that's that's a bit well, of a problem. Let's see a tour not ending in Paris. Yeah. I would. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my experience with other grand tours when they've not finished in capital cities or the city where they usually finish um, has been good. Generally, I thought that well, depending on to what extent that city embraces the race, but I, I have well, for example, the 2014 Vuelta finished in Santiago de Compostela. It was a great success. I thought. I'm sure the Tour de France will finish in Yorkshire one year. <laughs> Cary Verity will be working Could on it. Could have finished in Lord, couldn't they? Down there, way down oh. there in the southwest. We all love oh. Lord. My goodness, I'm, I'm mindful that, I, well, I have several things I complain about, Andorra being one, but of course, when I said Andorra was the worst place in, in Western Europe, it's toss I was up, completely it? wrong because Lourdes is, is even much worse. By uh, It's so bad, it's not even in the... Uh, well, I mean, it, it's not even on the same page. But it? let's not dwell on the negatives, because we are looking forward to two rest days in Annecy and Carcassonne, two of the very nicest places in France. But you said we're going to go through it week by week, um, Daniel. So we start in the west of France in the Vendée. First tour I ever did, 2005, also started in the Vendée. And we, we no prologue, uh, a road stage to, to begin with. Uh, and... Uh, and we kind of wind our way up to, to Brittany. Anything, I mean, we're, there's a lot of coast there. There's some quite... <laughs> there's a, there's a lot there's a of lot, There's a lot of coast. There's a lot of weather. There's a lot of weather there. Big sea. Big sea. <laughs> Big ocean. <laughs> the biggest. The biggest yeah. sea. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Um, All right. I'm, try, no, you know, I'm trying to help you along here. I'm trying you're to just... Abso- you're absolutely just right. Just prompt you to say something interesting about these early stages, which are also quite, quite, quite climby. Well, they are. They're, well, Mark Cavendish has already said that it looks like, on paper, um, one of the hardest tours, possibly the, the hardest tour that he'll, he'll have done, and not a huge amount of opportunities for the sprinters. Perhaps the first couple of days will go their way. And then there's a team time trial in Cholet, which I think will be uh, you know, interesting rather than kind of pivotal. Um, and then the, the hugging the coastline up to Sarzo, I mean, that is... Uh, I mean from a logistical point of view that it's quite remote getting out there right onto the western coast there and then the stage from Lorient to Campere which is stage 5 that looks like a, a, a really difficult day um, Christian Prudhomme described it as being like an Ardennes classic but held in the west of France and looking at the profile that will be um, that will be an interesting day as will the finish at the Mur de Bretagne and this year Unlike in 2011 and 2015, I think, when Cadell Evans won and Viermoz. Viermoz, Alexis Viermoz won on the top of the climb, they're actually going over it twice. Um, <coughs> so I think the, the tour organisers are realising that you can put in a, a, a cheeky little finish like the Mur de Bretagne, which is, which is difficult, but everybody kind of waits and waits, don't they? Um, and they... they well, the, the, particularly the year Evans won, it was kind of like a GC rider sprint up to the finish and perhaps having a little loop mm. not only is it better for the spectators on the ground watching the race because they get to see them come up the climb twice but it could make the racing different as well so you can see them over sort of a number of years reacting to how the riders tackle the stages and, and be- continuing to evolve and innovate Nibali didn't lost time didn't he in that, on that climb even though they only went up, went up at once in 2015 he was the defending champion and and we saw early on that year that he was probably not going to be uh, able to defend his title so you know these early climbing stages quite can be they're not they're not exactly the Alps or the Pyrenees but they can be be pretty challenging yeah and I think we'll talk later about whether or who this tour ultimately favours climbers or time trials. I think who it really favours, we can already say looking at the first week, is that the guys who are able to maintain their concentration and focus every single day because uh, there are going to be things, um, big things, <laughs> dangerous things. Here is um, there, 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 there's going to be something to test them mentally, if not physically, every single day. And... You know, riders like Thibaut Pino, who has struggled with that in the past. Um, on the first week, he's had issues, whether it be due to wind or cobbles or so forth. Um, and what? He, he's suffering with wind, has he? 
Right, yeah, he has. I think, yeah, in both senses. Well, Tom Dumoulin struggled with wind as well in the Giro. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think Froome will look at those stages pretty confidently because in terms of racing ability, um, well, he certainly has the, the pedigree in terms of maintaining concentration. But in terms of being going into those stages aggressively as well and not on the defensive, not thinking, oh, I don't want to lose anything today, but thinking, right, we're going to actually take this race on and we're going to make it hard for everyone else. I think he'll be looking looking forward to that week um, others will not you know the Quintanas the Pinos um, Dumoulin is a bit of an unknown quantity in that kind of setting I would say of course with eight riders in each team the, the number of riders being reduced by one next year um, that will there'll be some nervousness there'll be some caution perhaps and I think by making those stages quite tricky and testing early on particularly with the cobbled one um, to come at the end of the first phase of racing on the uh, on stage nine before the rest day and the transfer down to the Alps uh, you know there could be some you know teams could be eroded away a little bit in terms of their strength before the the, the two big blocks of mountains so you know that the, the organizers there have made it challenging made it not necessarily difficult to control but the teams will have to decide whether or not to take control early on or whether to wait and save uh, save everybody's legs until the mountains and you said Lionel that the team time trial might not be that significant in terms of time gains or losses but we've seen unfortunately we do see in team time trials teams crashing en masse and you know sometimes losing one two riders and having other riders who are injured and obviously um that is an even bigger disadvantage when they've only got eight in total that's the thing a lot of people made the the point that you know chris Froome won the the tour this year with with an eight with eight with seven teammates after losing garrett thomas pretty early the the problem isn't so much eight riders it's if you lose one and go down to seven or if you lose two and go down to six and then you really are at a disadvantage i would say i think you know there's been eight and nine might not be so much but there's been eight and seven it get the, the difference gets bigger you know the you know losing one to, to seven is more more significant than losing one to eight. yeah and there are going to be some big decisions for team managers to make um in terms of the obviously the composition of that eight it almost becomes more important to get it right and i don't think we're going to see any GC anyone with any designs on a high position on GC coming in with riders who are looking for stages looking to pursue any kind of personal ambitions that the eight riders have to be completely devoted to their leader well on stage nine the cobbled stage the mini Paris-Roubaix um, does this count as the first week or the second week because it's the last stage before the rest day but it's the ninth day of racing I, I mean my um, OCD tendencies would say although it's not seven days week one includes that second weekend did what you do know you that the 1990 Giro finished on a Wednesday did you know that yeah where, <laughs> where did that come from I've just, I just I, I've been wanting to get that in <laughs> well <laughs> did, <laughs> did you realise that this thing of the tour starting and that was to do with the World is. Cup as well that was to do with the World Cup really well the yeah. World Cup final is on that Sunday on July the 15th the, the cobbled stage the day before to Amio I have to mention that because uh my in-laws live there and Lionel Grant I think we'll be, we'll be uh, having another wow. night when we were there last time two years ago yeah two was years it? ago yeah. two years ago um, your father-in-law uh, served us a goose from his garden for mm-hmm. dinner it was it's absolutely around, delicious it's around now he go, it's around about this time of year he wanders into the garden uh I imagine he wears gloves for the. Don't task. want to, not to alienate um, any vegetarian no, or vegan listeners, yeah, Richard. I'm sure vegetarians and vegans do understand how meat arrives on the table. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, it's around about this time of year, so um, yeah, maybe he's preparing so, our our meals as we speak. So, will we be having Roman the uh, the goose, or Thibaut the goose, or <laughs> Wawa the goose? Thibaut's goose is cooked. <laughs> do you know it's a terrible talking of gastronomy. Um, it is an Epicurean things. Uh, it's a bad tour for wine. It's a bad tour for wine this year. Oh we'll go on to that later. Next year, even. Well, it's a good. I think in Roubaix, do they not? They drink wine in. Yeah, in but we'll be we'll be leaving Roubaix. In, uh, we'll be we'll in, <laughs> in brown paper bags. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll not be lingering in Roubaix for lots of reasons, but mainly because we've got a long a long transfer to Annecy that night. Stage does finish early, but that cobbled stage. I mean, we, we've had we've dabbled with the cobbles in recent years. What, why are you laughing at that? Yes, we have. You're right. Uh, we dabbled with the cobbles. This is a fully-fledged cobbled stage, isn't it? 15 sections of pavé. 
nearly um, 22 kilometers very, yeah very 100, 100, 100 you know quite a shortish stage 154 kilometer yeah. stage well there's uh yeah there's 47 kilometers before the first section of cobble so i mean you can imagine that being you know under an hour of absolutely breakneck racing because some guys will be wanting to get in the break the gc riders will be wanting to uh, make sure you know they're in a good position coming to the first three sections of Pave, none of which are familiar to people who've watched Paris Bay. But then after that, um, they have a number of sections. I think it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten sections of cobbles that have all been in this year's Paris Bay. So, although uh, Monzon Pavel, for example, it's a really difficult section in Paris Bay. By the looks of it, they're using only 900 meters of it, not uh, the full three kilometers. Um, they're also avoiding the Carrefour de Labre but the rest of it is uh, a, a full um, a full menu of Paris Bay cobbles and as you said Rich after kind of uh, 2014 was great because the weather was bad and uh, Astana with um, Vincenzo Nibali and yeah, uh, Fusang and, 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 and Lars Bo- well, Lars, Lars Bohm was riding for Lotto at Sorry, the time of course he was yeah, but he joined Astana later he, but, yeah. Lars Bohm won the stage mm. and, and it was uh, um Nibali, who really, um, you know, laid a, laid a foundation for mm. winning the tour on that day. Really, of course, Chris Froome wasn't on the cobbles that day because he'd uh, pulled out of the race before the, before he even reached the cobblestones. Um, but in recent years, you know, the, the tour has kind of skirted with the cobbles. I think this is a, this is really testing for GC can type you, riders. I can imagine Christian Prudhomme and Thierry Gouverneur when they, I don't know what they, how they ultimately commit the tour route to well to reality I don't know whether they press save as on their PDF or <laughs> press send or whatever I can imagine them wincing and grimacing clenching their buttocks as they did this thing is this is this too much and no they've gone ahead with it I think they do it in pencil first and then go over it in pen when yeah. they're when they're happy I don't know <laughs> is that how they I don't know but I think you're right Daniel I mean this is almost too much in I mean it's one of those days where everyone will look forward to it um, there'll be that suspicion that maybe people will be very very cautious but there will just be somebody who tries to to, to um, put the cat among the pigeons to use the old cliche and there's nowhere to hide that is as I say that is almost like the finale of Paris Bay and a lot of the GC riders won't no, they won't know it. And the one thing that struck me was I wonder whether we'll see some GC riders actually ride Paris Bay this year and, and see what it's like, even if they're Cri- not up at Cri- the front. Chris Froome was, was asked that question. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that would be interesting to see. What, what interests me about it, I think, is that it comes pretty late. I mean, that f- second Sunday of the tour is usually a kind of showcase showpiece mountain stage this year it was a stage of Chambry that, that, that second weekend is traditionally the first kind of skirmish overall skirmish so it's fascinating that, to see that play out on cobbles rather than in the mountains because I think that's a factor we're quite deep into the race then you know things are, are, are there are patterns beginning to be established it's, it's, it's late enough into the race that you know, perhaps there'll be riders who look on it, GC riders look on it as an opportunity. Do you not think, though, that ASO, having broadcast the whole of Paris Bay this year, having enjoyed steadily upward uh, viewing figures in the last few years, knowing that Paris Bay always delivers, even in, even an ordinary Paris Bay is 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 a is a watchable spectacle from start to finish, more or less. This is where cycling is going up against the World Cup, isn't it? And um, it's a it's a great day of televised sport for people who like both cycling and football. And I think there there may be sort of a reason or method to the to the madness here of scheduling it so that it's going to not compete with the World Cup for people's attention, but it's going to draw a huge audience. People are going to want to know what happens that day. The cycling podcast is supported by Science in Sport. My name's Ian Boswell, I'm a professional cyclist with Team Sky, and I'm fueled by science and sport. Well, I think fueling depends on, on the climate, and we've spoken before about how, how you fuel for the heat and how important hydration is. In the cold, obviously hydration is important, but I think also the consumption of calories while riding is much higher in the cold because you're obviously having to heat your body. And I was actually talking to Dombrowski about it last night, and we were talking about winter training and just how much more you have to eat when it's when the temperatures are cold and then you also have to think about what products to bring on the ride because if you're training in extreme cold conditions you know you get a bar that's been in your pocket for a couple hours and it's frozen solid or you know you can't really bite through it so 
you know, and also, you know, especially through the winter months, you know, when you're trying to kind of build back muscle that you may have lost over the off season, the consumption of protein is really important. So that's why something like the SIS Way 20 gel is so easy because it's, it's portable. And actually I found that they're more delicious in winter time because kind of like a creamy, a creamy pocket of gel. And uh, they go down really easy in the winter, but just a matter of staying fueled, you know, through the winter, even though, you know, in the winter, it's important to, a lot of riders are trying to lose weight. And so there's a, sometimes a, like a mentality to not, to cut down on calories, but it's so important to continue eating, you know, to lose weight, which sounds counterintuitive, but you know, you have to, a hot fire burns hotter than a fire with no fuel. So my fiance and I have just purchased a house in Peachum, Vermont, which is between nowhere and nowhere. But um, no, it's a beautiful place and you know, there's tons of good riding. Nordic skiing in the winter, which I'll probably have to get a pair of skis for this winter to do a bit of training. But yeah, in the, the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. If you speak to the old time Vermonters, they've mentioned, you know, in years past, like winters of, I guess, minus 30 Fahrenheit. So I don't know what that is in Celsius, but pretty, pretty darn cold. Although the, the past several winters haven't been nearly that bad. I had one rod when I was living out in California of all places, but I was up training in the Sierra Nevadas and we got stuck in a snowstorm and we had no food and it was so cold that we got to the point where we had to like stop in someone's house and we grabbed like some, in the US you have like, you know, when they, someone delivers the morning paper, they put it in like a kind of a plastic bag and someone had a bunch of them. So we took four of them, put, put them over our feet, put them over our hands to try to get off this mountain and it was freezing cold, but we had no food so your hands can't work so you couldn't even open a bar. And you just get to the point where you're just trying to, you just want to get home. And I think I went into the shower with all my kid on because I was just so cold. I couldn't, I couldn't function to undo zippers and whatnot. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. We heard there from Ian Boswell uh, giving us some of his uh, winter fueling tips. He, of course, is off to Team Katusha for next year. Maybe maybe he'll be in the Tour de France team. Who knows? He's certain, certainly bound to have more opportunities there, I think, than, than he's had at Team Sky. And I know he's looking forward to that, to the challenge. Um, a reminder, you can get 20% off all your Science & Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code CPAUG20. So, Lionel, it is... Uh, what is it? It's... Uh, Sunday, July the 15th and at 3 o'clock we're watching the finish of stage 9 of the Tour de France and then we're jumping in a car and driving down to Annecy. It's a long uh, way. I'm going to suggest that we stay and we, we stay and watch the World Cup final on television that Sunday evening and get the TGV down on the Monday, no? With Scotland having not now qualified for the World Cup, my interest in it is pretty pretty minimal so uh, yeah, you know because otherwise I'd be looking forward to watching Scotland in the World Cup final uh, but um, I, I don't know it depends who's in the World Cup final if dare I say it if um, if England are in the World I'll Cup n- final I'll not be watching England <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd rather just I'd rather just I'd rather just I think press on I think Ireland v France would be the, the dream <laughs> result no anyway <laughs> anyway anyway moving on um, uh, we're into we're, so we're into we're definitely into week two now um, as as I said earlier Chris Froome thought there was going to be a, a time trial around Lake Annecy um, which we had in 2009 didn't we Alberto Contador didn't win that uh, Cancellara won it but Contador more or less sealed his overall win in 2009 around Lake Annecy. Contador did win it. Did he win it? Yeah, he did, did he win it. Because we saw, well, you know, with me when Cancellara came into mm, the, the press sorry. room, was in a casino, mm. and we were sitting there, I was sitting there with Bernie Eisel. I think I was doing oh. an interview with Bernie Eisel, who, of course, good chums, good friends with Cancellara, and Cancellara came in and ordered a beer, slammed it down on the bar, and started ranting about Contador getting help from the motorbikes. Ah, okay. It was also That was also the time trouble where Mark Cavendish did he not get off and challenge some uh, yeah, some British called fans? Him fat. <laughs> he called and he, him and he fat. turned around. <laughs> he turned around, went back up a hill. And did he not almost confront? eliminate himself in doing that? <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> so lots of happy memories. In, hey! <laughs> in I, I rode that course um, that morning, and mm. um, some Aussie fans were p- taking. They didn't call you me. fat, did they? They did actually. Uh, well, they, <laughs> they basically mocked me, ran alongside me. Obviously, they didn't have to. They walked alongside me <laughs> as I was going over the climb, mocking my weight. 
That's um, terrible. I, I had no comeback. You're always just warming up for Cavendish. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're, we're definitely into, uh, into week two now and into the mountains. Uh, Daniel, what can you tell us about these, these, these three stages in, in the Alps? Well, we expected something different, a, a different twist on the Alpe d'Huez day, didn't we? We thought they'd be going up either the Col de Sarene or from Villa Recula from the west. They're not, are they? They're going up um, the traditional way. Um, the other stage, it's very noisy here suddenly, isn't it? Um, the stage to La uh, Rosière, that's never been used in the Tour de France before. It's been used in the Tour de l'Avenir. That's one of the three, I would say there are three real pure summit finishes in this Tour de France. Um, that is one of them. We're also going over the Plateau de Glier. Um, and on that climb it's a very steep climb about five kilometers and there's a section of two kilometers which are not tarmac now I don't know Rich I'm kind of ashamed of myself for not knowing this um, I don't know when the last time the Tour de France went over a non tarmac road was but curiously later in the race or you do know you look as though you know well I mean obviously Pave that's an unpaved road isn't it uh, the cobblestones are um, not tarmac um, just going back in time to week one uh, the big disappointment for me is that the stage that finishes at Mur de Bretagne doesn't go over the Ribinou which are the farm tracks of Brittany um, which the Trobroléon race use uh, lots of reports locally and in fact um, we made a, a short episode for Friends of the Podcast about the Trobro Lyon which we put out in April and the organisers were absolutely convinced that ASO were looking at the, their territory um, to, to take the tour off road and onto the farm tracks but it hasn't happened this year. The ideal opportunity to do so um, and also uh, given that it's uh, 40 years since Bernardino's first Tour de France victory, no st- visit to Ifinac either the, um, his home village a tiny little place but you know uh, that's a little bit of a surprise but um, we've gone back to Brittany we should we should speed but back think, down to the Alps yeah now. but what's, what is interesting about the unpaid road is is that it, it is a sign of how cycling is you know professional cycling is sort of reinventing itself and going back in time it, itself going back to it, it, its roots and seeking out new dimensions to the racing I, I think this is one of the most interesting things that's happened over the last 10 years or so and a lot yeah. of it probably stems from the success of Strada Bianchi doesn't it yeah and another interesting innovation Rich we speculated this year about whether the, spectac- the spectacle of the very short 100 kilometer mountain stage in the Pyrenees would inspire ASO to include more stages like that in the future and and be the face of the, well the Tour de France's future um and this year they've doubled the dose haven't they because there's an, there are two extremely short stages um, one in the Alps which is the stage to La Rosière so 108 kilometres um, also going over the Col du Pré that day which is so it's kind of the hipsters call them. The hipster way up the Cormet de Roseland, um, a famous Tour de France climb, but they've never been up that way before. It's quite a hard climb, very nice climb, been up it. Um, and so there's that short stage, and there's going to be another even shorter one, 65 kilometres in the Pyrenees. Um, so quite a tough helping of alpine action, I would suggest. And we reach uh, the Pyrenees. I, I, I like the fact also that the Pyrenees come second. I don't know why. Um, you know just quite like this way of, of doing the tour but we go via through the massive central don't we to Mond we, it's difficult to know at this point exact routes um, but we know start start and finishes um, but that you know that that could be a tough stage again in the past um, 2010 in particular when Sage finished at Mond that was a really savage day which almost did a lot of damage didn't in the end but those sorts of stages can be can be hard and then the next day into Carcassonne is that another is that another sprinter stage that we think no it's not it's Actually, not there's a, there's a tough climb uh, about a 1200 metre high climb in the finale there and a, a descent into Carcassonne in the finish so could see some general classification action that day as well because um, what we do know about the state of Mond is that it will finish where it always where the tour always finishes uh, in Mond, which is at the aerodrome. Which really, I mean, I said there were only three pure summit finishes, mountain top summit finishes, but um, that's a hard climb. It's about four kilometer climb, is it? Um, steep, and um, it's certainly somewhere where a pure climber can make up time. 
when we get to Carcassonne, rest day in Carcassonne, of course, I am going to tackle Ellis Bacon's um, world record three Cassiolets in two days. Um, quite a few years ago now, he had one for lunch, one for dinner, and then one for dinner the following night, and, and then had a big lie down. I'm going to try and beat that. I don't, having... I don't think Ellis has woken up since then, has <laughs> <No>. he? <laughs> I'm going to try and beat that. Four Cassiolets in two days. I'm <laughs> going to see if anyone wants to try and match me. <laughs> or share a car with me afterwards. <laughs> Whoever you are, whatever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. Thank you very much to our main sponsor, Rafa. Their support has enabled us to bring you these podcasts throughout the year and to cover the Grand Tours, as we have done. And obviously with the announcement of the Tour de France route, we're looking forward to next year as well. Uh, A few items of business. Um, I mentioned I was in Monaco last week we were doing a few things I was with Orla Shinoui we recorded an episode of the cycling podcast Femina with Tiffany Cromwell that went out at the start of this week uh, really fascinating chat with, with her um, she's a kind of SRAM rider has been a professional for quite a number of years and uh, has a really interesting perspective on things so it's a chat with Tiffany Cromwell uh, we also met with uh, Chris Froome and Michelle Froome Orla interviewed Michelle something she'd wanted to do for a while that will be our I think our first friend special of 2018 and details of how you become a friend of the podcast for 2018 will be revealed very soon um, we did a few other things met up with the Young Americans that was a, a podcast we did a couple of years ago um, Ian Boswell Joe Dombrowski and Larry Warbass and that will be a, a friend special early in 2018 as well met up with them in, in Nice um, but I th- we thought we'd play a little bit of Chris Froome because we did chat a bit about the, the Tour de France next year and his his quest to win a fifth title so we thought we'd play a little excerpt um, from a much longer uh, conversation that as I say will be released um, early in 2018 so here was Chris Froome last week talking about next year's tour and his rivals the way I see it is each each year it feels as if it's it's getting harder for me it's getting more difficult the the level of my rivals is is getting getting higher every year I think people are learning to to train better um, more and more people are, are going to altitude every year um, just pulling out all the stops to to be at their absolute best and I, I, I think that we, we've seen that in the racing over the last over the last 12 months is that the races have been a lot closer um, they have been a lot more hard fought especially the Grand Tours uh, sometimes only being decided in the, in the last couple of days um, and I think next year we'll, we'll just be all that again um, and, 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 and even even closer next year I mean obviously there's a prospect of Dumoulin coming into the picture um, potentially to, to target the Tour de France I think um, guys strong guys also but like, like Richie Richie Port for example who can, who can, who can time trial and climb extremely well um, I think it all, it all depends what kind of routes we'll get for the Grand Tours next year and who's who's going to end up doing what at the end of the day mm. but I think whatever program I select I, I know I'm going to have uh, three, four, five guys who potentially could win the race Do you think about those guys a lot? I, I know that writers often say oh no I just think about myself I focus on you know what I, the thing I can control but I get the impression you, you, you over the last couple of years in particular have Showing yourself to be a, a racer, um, you know, really pressing home the advantage when you see an opportunity, you know, and that's pressing home the advantage over these rivals. I mean, over the last two or three years, have you? Do you find thoughts of Naira Quintana, Vincenzo Nibali, these guys? Do you think about them a lot? I do, I do, I do, and I, especially in my training, I, I, I think about how, um, how I'm going to tackle a race. Um, I think it also changes how I. Um, tactically how we ride a race uh, how, how we ride a Grand Tour um, I think in the Tour this year for example knowing that that time trial in Marseille um, was at the end of the race and I, I'd hedge most of my bets on, on being able to be better than the Roman Bardet and and the pure climbers in, in that time trial um, I, I didn't necessarily need to attack the climbs um, whereas I think that changes de- depending on who I'm who I'm riding against. 
Well, that leads obviously to the question of Tom de Moulin. Do you, do you wake up at night screaming, thinking about Tom de Moulin? <laughs> no, certainly not. Certainly not. In a, in a way, I quite relish the the, the challenge. Um, I think it would be great to go head to head with him properly in a in a grand tour that I haven't haven't really done yet. Um, so I, I hope he does does uh, decide to to ride ride the tour as well. But it's fair to say you haven't really uh, met an opponent opponent like him before. Um, somebody who you can't rely on getting that that cushion uh, over him in a in a time trial. Um, that's going to change surely the way that you. We don't know the route yet. We'll yeah. know it next week. But that's going to change the way you approach the the tour next year, isn't it? I imagine. I imagine it probably would. Um, as you said, we we need to see what the route looks like. But I think that probably would mean that I. I'd have to put a lot more focus into the climbs and know that okay, I can I can hold my own in the time trials, but chances are from against Tom Dumoulin, I'd need to make that time up in in the mountains. That was Chris Froome. Uh, you can become a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. Still got a couple to come for this year. One on t- the team of the year, Team Sunweb. Daniel's beavering away on that, and we've got uh, a lunch with Lionel with a mystery guest. And the other bit of business uh, for this week is to tell you that our event on the 20th of November that we've mentioned a couple of times, that's Monday the 20th of November, will be held at the Arts Theatre West End. That's on Great Newport Street in central London, right by Leicester Square. Yeah, um, keep an eye on our Twitter handle at cycling underscore podcast or even better, go to the website thecyclingpodcast.com and If you're on our mailing list, you should also get a note note. Well, if you're not on the mailing list sign up and uh, get advance notice of when the tickets are going on sale. Uh, It should be any day now, but uh, if you want to come along to the Art Theatre on November the 20th and see us and our friends in action We have a number of familiar voices, you'll be able to put faces to voices and we'll have a uh, a celebrity guest from the world of professional cycling there as well it should be a really good night and we're looking forward to it the three of us will be there of course um, Daniel what? week three of the Tour de France so we, we, we wake up in Carcassonne on the morning of July the 24th and we head to our favourite place surely on any tour Luchon oh. Bagnères de Luchon Um favourite oh it's, it's a beautiful well, it's spot. nice enough it's nice enough I mean yeah I like it yeah, yeah it's, it's nice, nice enough, enough. Yeah. bottom of the Paris sword isn't it pretty generic French town generic <laughs> what <French. laughs> is um, anyway I'm going to say something that's going to shock you I'm going to say something that's really going to shock you I think that the, the third week of this well next year's Tour de France features the hardest climb the Tour de France has ever done that's a climb that has me. never been on the uh, not the whole the whole of this climb hasn't been on the route before the Col de Porte um, on stage 17 so that's at the end uh, it's the summit finish of the very short stage we talked about 65 kilometer stage the Col de Porte is 2,215 meters high it's 16 kilometers at 8.7% now Alpe d'Huez is I think 13.4 kilometers at 8.1% or 8.2% um, this is in statistically this is fairly similar to Mont Ventoux but it is um slightly steeper not quite as long but slightly steeper um, and it finishes higher 2,215 metres where altitude is going to be a factor um, also if you're going to watch the Tour de France next year it's an absolutely beautiful climb if you stand at the top you can pretty much see down um, the whole climb it's completely unobstructed views totally exposed um, last point on this it is really a continuation of the Plaid Adé climb that everyone fondly remembers as the scene of George Hincapie's only victory in a mountain mountain stage in the Tour de France in 2005. Mm. Eyebrows were raised that day, weren't they? And that's the short stage, 65 kilometres. Also, it, well, it basically goes straight up the Perisor, doesn't it, at the start? And then the Val Laurent as well in, in yeah. the middle. So a, an awful lot of climbing packed into um, very little distance. Um, this is a, this is doubling down on the short mountain stage model that we've, we've seen that's really since, uh, what, 2011 when Alpe d'Huez stage was only 110 or 120 kilometres, something like that. Um, but it's not, it's not a brand new thing. Back in the 80s, they would have very short stages, but usually as part of a split day, they'd have two short stages. I'm thinking... They did it in 96 as well with... Uh 
be underneath. <laughs> not because, uh, not by design though. That exciting was stage though. It was what? two kilometers, wasn't it? Was to it? Like that, yeah. yeah, the snow closed the climb mm. before it, didn't it? So they basically just raced along the a valley a bit and then up, up Sestriere. Also, at the I mean, Giro, they did it one year. Andy Hampson won a, a stage that was about thirty. Five kilometers, pretty much straight up a climb. Yeah, but no hiding place in a stage like that, is there? I mean, uh, everyone will be warming up. It will go from the gun, and it will be a day where you know it's not long, but it will. Everyone will go into the red. It will be. It, there's no room for caution there, and I think that's a really interesting. I mean, one to sit down and watch from what, start to finish. I mean, we heard from sure. Chris Froome at the start of this segment, and you know, he'll be. The interesting thing about Froome, the way he's approached Grand Tours, has been how much he has you know worked his w- worked on the the areas that he he would he would need so looking at this he will be working presumably on these sort of intense efforts climbs etc and i think the surprise in this route is how little time trial there was because i think there's a sense that the tour would like tom de Mula. tom de Mula is quite an attractive new star in the world of cycling but on the other hand the the the, the french hopefuls at the moment the great french riders at the moment are are not time trialists they're, they're, they're good climbers Roman Bardet Warren Barguil uh, Thibaut Pino decent time trialist but it, it's a difficult one it's a bit of a dilemma for them that isn't it do they design a route that would suit a Dumoulin they might do that next year or one that favours the, the French riders the thing about Froome is, as he said is he's an all rounder he can adapt to either well I think I think from that point of view you say it's difficult Rich I, I actually think it's quite easy because the biggest priority that they probably have one would imagine would be having another French winner um, 1985 was the the last occasion when a French man won the Tour de France you know of course and they I mean it's difficult to conceive of a, of a route based on this year anyway where Roman Bardet is going to be at uh, an obvious advantage over Chris Froome but I think this is as good as he'll get um, particularly if we look at the final time trial 31 kilometres and it's pretty much a mountain stage um, 31 kilometres not just one very hard climb but several um steep hills and it's a real well a, a specialist route but not a specialist time trialist route it's a specialist climbers route I wouldn't rule out Dumoulin though I mean Bergen was quite a hilly time trial uh, Dumoulin took over a minute out of Froome there and, and I think his team won the team time trial as well I think they'll be they'll be very competitive in that he should be good on, on the cobbles as well when we saw the Bink Bank Tour how, how much of an all-rounder he is too so I I think Dumoulin still might be a real a real threat yeah, I think the big question mark for me in Dumoulin is that the level of concentration um, and the, the level of consistency over the three weeks, the level of consistency for his team as well. And you never know when. I mean, we, we've we talked quite a bit this year about how um, often nowadays uh, with so many riders competing for not just the victory in Grand Tours, but just high placings. I'm so desperate to achieve those high placings that... Um, riders can use other teams quite a lot but you can't count on that can you You never know when your team is going to be vital and so you do need to go in with as strong a team as possible Um, and you you look at the paradoxically a stage like that very short one the 65 kilometer stage the team might be more vital there than ever because um, attacks will come early and actually leaders might get isolated pretty early Um, so (laughs) Some web haven't really reinforced a great deal in the mountains. I don't think. I think I'm right in saying in terms of the riders they've recruited for next year, they weren't terribly strong in the Giro this year. So that is a question mark from my point of view. And you know, just how he deals with that that first week, there's no doubt that there are that there'll be two, three, four riders who lose the tour that week. Yeah, it strikes me. It's a bit like a Tour de France modelled on the Vuelta, isn't it? There's no, there's not many opportunities to have an off, uh, an easy day, um, and there are things that up, unsettle the rhythm. Rich, you talked about the the transitional stages, the ones that go across the um, the middle of France from the Alps to the Pyrenees, um, and they're the kind of days where everyone has to be switched on because there's a you know something could happen it probably won't but they're the ones that mentally and physically wear people down and then even in the Pyrenees it's kind of there's it's not a block of stages the, the one to po kind of breaks the rhythm a little bit before then uh, the, the one that, uh, that that goes over the Aspan the Tourmalet and the Orbisk. Um yeah it's, so it's, it's challenging mentally as, as well as physically and the, looking at it on paper 
there's nothing to necessarily wait for. It's not like the the Giro that De Moulin has just won, where the the time trial at the end he could be really confident. He could calculate how much time can I uh, can I leave myself to try and make up on the last day. That time trial um, down in the very southwest corner of France, still in the Pyrenees, really, isn't it? Um, that is going to be unpredictable there's it's not one where anyone can go in and go well even Chris Froome I can take 40 seconds here or I can take a minute here and it will be okay they can probably they could probably say that but no more they could probably say a minute but if you look at the amount of climbing there is in the rest of the race and um, there's more than enough terrain for a, a Quintana or a Bardet or a Pino to well to to not be faced by that not be daunted by having to go into that time trial uh, a minute ahead of, of Froome it's a climbing competition this year's oh, next year's tour really yeah but the you know the the the, the prospect of the presence of Dumula just it it, it just changes things in, interestingly whereby if the focus is on de Moulin and Froome and both of them are thinking about that time trial then perhaps there's an opportunity for some, somebody else to take advantage of that I mean Froome as he said earlier does base his race on his opponents and mm-hmm. having to focus on different types of opponents next year could be an interesting scenario I think another another thing uh, speculating about the course is 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 one thing it's even more of a fool's game to speculate about the weather but we do spend a lot of time in northern France next year almost half the race really and that Froome does not does not he likes the heat you know and, and you, around Brittany especially you can get some pretty pretty bad weather equally it could be baking sunshine you just don't know but it can it can be nasty and you know in 2014 uh, when Froome crashed and then and then was out it was maybe no coincidence that it was it was bad weather as well it doesn't it doesn't suit him he doesn't like it and we even saw that at the Vuelta this year too taking speculation to new heights I know here. even the Met Office doesn't try and predict yeah, the weather know. in nine months time no, I, know. <laughs> I know I know it might be it might be, it might be lovely but if, if the weather does become a factor I'm definitely going to dig out this part of this podcast and play it again in our Tour de France coverage next year that is absolutely guaranteed and if it's hot and sunny you can call me radish face again (laughs) can't you Rich when I catch the sun well yeah (laughs) anyway anyway we should uh, we should wrap things up there because Daniel's got to go and catch some a train back to Berlin. Um, just a, kind of a extraordinary train back stuff. to Berlin. Yeah. Um, you, a quick thank you to James uh, Fippen, uh, who you will find on Twitter at Graphi Velo, G R A P H I Velo. He sent us some lovely prints featuring some of the Tour de France mountains and the the riders, some legends of the tour. Uh, I've got your copies of those at the moment, Daniel and Lyle, but you will get them. But they're very nice. They're in my office at the moment and uh, really brightening the place up. So thank you, James, for those. Um, I say at Graffivello very very uh, gratefully received that gift thank you Uh, so as I say the details of our show on the 20th of November will be announced very soon listen to the Cycling Podcast Femina which is out at the moment and uh, more friend specials to come at the cyclingpodcast.com and we got through the whole podcast without me mentioning Watford's 2-1 win over Daniels until now until now wonderful style. okay the best to last that's anyway. wonderful Rich alright <laughs> Daniel bon, bon voyage safe home thank you Lionel thank you very much thank you very much whoever you are whatever you ride whatever the reason Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world.